So my study this week came to mind as I was reading Clarence Larkin's commentary on the parable of the mustard seed on page 89 of his book, uh, Dispensational Truth. And the verses on this parable uh, are as follows. You've got three uh, key areas in the Gospels uh, where it talks about this parable of the mustard seed. You have Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 32, Mark chapter 4, verses 30 to 34, and Luke chapter 13, verses 18 to 21. And we're going to be reading from Mark chapter 4 and verse 30 to 34. The Bible says this, And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up, and becometh greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And with many such parables spake ye the word unto them, as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone he expounded all things to his disciples. Amen. So, in this study I'm not going to be going into all of the details of this parable of the mustard seed. Uh, I'd like to in a future study. Um, but when you uh, have a look at this parable in greater detail, you'll find a similarity between this tree and the growth of what Clarence Larkin calls visible Christianity, i.e. You know, that, that is the, the church that the world sees and labels as Christian, and that includes every Catholic church and every false cult that uh, has the name of Christ that pretends to be Christian. So it's this great big uh, structure, this church, that has these birds, these fowls of the air, nesting in its branches. And if you look at Revelation 18 and verse 2, you have a cross-reference on the thing of every unclean and hateful bird. And birds, if you do a big study on it in your Bible, and I may do this uh, in another week's study, uh, they can picture devils and unclean spirits oftentimes in the Bible. And we know these spiritual beings, these devils, uh, their purpose is to sow lies and false doctrine and to stir up trouble in the world today as they form part of the devil's hierarchy of how he runs this world. And if we think about these birds in the parable for a moment, they shelter and lodge under the shadow of this tree. They are not part of the tree. And they're using this tree for their own advantage. And their presence in the tree brings corruption. And this is a picture of the wicked who've used the name of Christ for their own profit and advantage. How often do we see it in the world today? People using the words church, the Latter day Saints Church, Christian Science Church. There's all these churches, but they've nothing to do with the, the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's all of these groups who claim that they are Christian and all they're doing is fleecing people and making money and merchandise out of the Lord's people who for the most part are not reading or studying their Bibles today. That's the majority of Christians today and I hope you're not one of them who are not doing that. And as such these uh, Christians who are not in their Bibles they are totally susceptible to deception and manipulation by these people. You know, you think over here in the UK, you've got this thing on the TV. I don't watch TV, but you've got this thing called God TV. And I'm sure you've got this all over the world. These televangelists, they call themselves, who profit greatly uh, by playing at being a Christian. You know, you've got Kenneth Copeland. He's got a net worth of $760 million. Pat Robertson, a net worth of $100 million. He's uh, oftentimes on this... Um, I forget the name of this big TV show, but he's, he's a familiar face on Christian, quote-unquote, Christian TV. And Rick Warren, he's worth $25 million. And these are people who are 
using, as I've said, the name of Christ for their own profit. And there are many others. And when you look at this parable of the mustard seed, you'll find that the tree really is a picture of, of the state of the, the visible church prior to the rapture. And when we've looked at the church of Laodicea in previous studies and the later passages of the Pauline epistles, we understand that things are going to be dire, that the world is going to uh, get worse and worse and worse up until the Lord returns and restores all things. And we are living in these dire times today. We read the words of the Lord Jesus here in Luke 18. And Luke chapter 18 verse 8 says this, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Now that is the Lord Jesus speaking of the condition of the world prior to the second advent. Shall he find faith on the earth? And you think, you know, once the rapture happens, all of these uh, believers all over the world who are sealed by the Holy Spirit, they are gone, they are taken from the earth, and there will be no uh, witness for the Lord up until the 144,000 do their work in the tribulation. And of course you have the angel in heaven preaching the tribulation gospel, but it's going to be incredibly uh, spiritually dark. And we think about what's happened over the past hundred years or so, the 20th century, and how we've got to our situation today, especially in this country. It seems as though the devil has enjoyed a wonderful uh, success over the last hundred years in undoing all of the work of the Reformation. And he's turned these historically Protestant Bible reading nations into, today we have these majority atheistic, secular, perverted, uh, tyrannical dictatorships. We look at how these countries, including Australia and Canada, have been acting over the past two years, and it's absolutely shocking. And I was reading some statistics online about um, people and their belief in God and whether or not they claim to be Christian. Over here in the UK, I believe as of 2020, 51% uh, of all people in this country say that they are officially atheistic. And, you know, there's a portion of that, I don't know what the amount is that claim to be Christian, but they lump every, as I've said, every false cult and sect, including the Catholic Church, in with that portion of Christians. So the amount of people who are born again in this country is very small indeed. And in the Netherlands, it's 55% of people claim to be atheistic. And you just wonder how on earth we got here. And we see this with the UK, you know, these um, historically Protestant nations, which used to have the Bible uh, influencing the government. This biblical influence has all but been removed. You know, we think about this guy Rishi Sunak, who uh, is now the Prime Minister of the UK. He um, was sworn into Parliament on the Bhagavad Gita, this Hindu unholy book when he entered office they're not even uh, making a nod to the bible anymore it doesn't matter it, we've become a, a paganized secular nation uh, that wants nothing to do with the lord and there's a couple of other things i want to talk about um, regarding the parable of the mustard seed the state of the church the state of the world all prior to the lord's return and this isn't the intention of my um study today i want to focus on something else but just to set the scene in a little more detail we think about the bible version issue and this really kicks off in the 20th century you know the devil is he has successfully um, convinced the majority of christians to give up their king james bibles in favor of these new versions that are based upon egyptian ultimately uh, manuscripts and Alan O'Reilly, he's been sending me a number of his uh, writings on the Bible version issue this week to change on our website to update. And I've been reading a couple of the articles and I've had a bit of a, a refresher, a brush up on some of the key issues with the modern translations. 
So all of these modern Bibles, your NIV, ESV, uh, NLT, they all almost perfectly line up with the teachings of the Jesuit uh, Dewey Reams Bible of 1582. And you could call this Bible the grandfather of the modern counterfeit Bibles. All of the words that have been removed, the words that have been changed, the doctrines that have been put in there that teach work salvation, that basically uh, cover the the tracks of, of the Catholic Church and their uh, anti-scriptural, anti-Christ abuses, they all line up with this original Jesuit Dewey Reims Bible. And this Bible of 1582, I shouldn't call it a Bible, it's an unholy book. It was brought out as part of the Pope's attempt to counter the Reformation by getting rid of certain doctrines that condemn the practices of Rome. And that's, that was all done in an attempt to deceive Christians and to bring these uh, Protestant nations back into the Dark Ages and back under the Pope's control. And here we are today in the year 2022. And the devil has largely succeeded in his plans and he is getting his world system ready uh, for the arrival of his man of sin, the Antichrist, ahead of his final attempt to totally annihilate and exterminate the Jewish people. You see, the Holocaust, it was just a, a precursor, a practice attempt uh, ahead of the horror that is to come in the time of Jacob's trouble, when the devil, he will do all that he can to destroy the Lord's people. And going back to Clarence Larkin's uh, Dispensational Truth on page 89, where he talks about the parable of the mustard seed, he mentions several characters in the Bible that he associates with these birds of the air. So, you, you know, you could devotionally, I suppose, take the tree to be a church. You know, it wouldn't be a doctrinal application. But you have these people who come in uh, amongst these Christians in a local church fellowship who cause problems, who don't belong who stir up strife and cause contention. And there are characters uh, mentioned all throughout the Bible who have caused trouble for the Lord's people. And oftentimes the Lord, he'll name names and put certain people in his word um, in order to teach us lessons, really, in order to highlight certain shortcomings and failures of people. And... He does this so we can watch out for these failures and these sins in ourselves and in our church today. And today's message, it's, I, I want to focus really on how our actions and more specifically how our, how our sins, how our misdeeds affect other members of the body of Christ. And in Larkin's uh, commentary, he mentions uh, three groups of people specifically in the New Testament um, who have caused problems for the Lord's people. And I'm going to begin in Acts chapter 4 with the account of Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 4. And we read uh, all the way from verse 32, and we're going to go to Acts 5.11. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. So if I stop there, modern scholarship and these liberal seminaries, oftentimes they'll take this verse and they'll use it to teach that the Bible teaches communism. It's interesting, isn't it? And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. Here we go. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold. You see, this uh, erroneous interpretation comes from the thing of not rightly dividing the word of God. We have um, things being different in the early apostolic period of the church age and as such the christians they were living together they were sharing 
but we know that things are very different today. We do not have the apostles uh, walking around the earth today. Things have changed. But it's a lovely picture of fellowship and it's a lovely picture of Christians looking after one another's needs and helping each other and ministering. And verse 35 says this, And laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So people are being totally selfless. And the satanic counterfeit of this um, benevolent giving would be communism, where the government forces you to give up your property, and they decide who has access to what. Man cannot rule himself. Verse 36, And Joseph, and he's a good man, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted, the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. A picture of a Christian who is totally sold out to the Lord, is giving up his possessions, in that sense he's raising money, and he's putting it into the ministry. He wants to do the Lord's work with his life, with everything he has, with his substance. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So everybody else is all in for the ministry. They're selling what they've got and they're giving it to the apostles. These men who have these signs and wonders, who have personally seen the Lord Jesus. But these two his wife being his co-conspirator, are not all in. They are not fully committed. And just wait what happens next. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Note there, the devil can influence a believer. The devil can tempt you. And he can get you into sin. Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? You had responsibility, Ananias. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. He dies. He's struck dead. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing uh, what was done, came in. So she doesn't know he's died. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. She just lied to Peter, the apostle. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. So these two are struck dead for lying. You know, how many Christians would be struck dead if the, if the Lord operated in the same way today? It's quite incredible. But Ananias and Sapphira are two characters that we can uh, more closely examine. So what, what, what sin do they get involved with? Well, they get involved with idolatry and lying. Idolatry and lying. They love money more than the work of the Lord. That is what is at the, the seat of their affections. And they lie to the apostles and indirectly they're lying to the Lord. They are his men. You know, it's like when uh, when Saul, before he's converted, when he persecutes the believers, the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why, When you persecute the Lord's people, when you do anything bad to the Lord's people, you are in fact doing it to the Lord. So they've lied and they've been caught up in idolatry. And what's happened here is they've kept back part of the money that they should have given to the Lord's work. And what impact does this have on the believers? Well, 
everybody else, the men like Joseph earlier in the passage, they are all in for the Lord. But these two, Ananias and Sapphira, they will not bear their fair share of the burden. They will not commit. They are not sold out for the Lord. They want to keep, you know, a foot in this world. They can't quite fully commit. They can't quite trust the Lord. They have to um, have their nest feathered, so to speak, in this world. And it's a picture of unbelief as well. And as a type of Christian, Ananias and Sapphira, they would represent a worldly Christian who won't give and who loves this present world and who lies, who deceives others and ultimately who sponges off other believers. And you get these types of people in churches all of the time and they cause big problems. And what is the outcome of their behaviour? Well, the two are dropped dead. It's a picture of the judgment of God falling upon an unrepentant Christian. You know, these you get, of course, after salvation, you are eternally secure, but God will continue to deal with you. He will chastise you. He will correct you gently and harshly at times if you're not listening. And if you get so messed up and you're just going to cause more and more and more problems and you're hardened and unrepentant, the Lord may just take you home early. I believe that. So, Ananias and Sapphira, they are two types, really, of troublemakers that we may deal with as uh, born-again believers today. And we've got to be aware of their shortcomings in our own lives. Do we lie? Do we hold back a part of what we owe to the Lord in time, money, efforts? Are we fully committed or do we love this present world? The second character I want to talk about is Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer, and he appears in Acts chapter 8 and verses 9 onwards. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. He's um, self-promoting. Uh, self-aggrandizing and he is a total um, opposite of the Lord Jesus Christ who sought to make of himself no reputation well this this man Simon he gives out that himself was some great one I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail afterwards but verse 10 onwards says this to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. So the people are getting sucked in by this man. Think about Todd White and all these uh, fake healers who are doing these fake signs and wonders, Torben Sondergaard, and people get sucked in by them because they're not reading their Bibles. They're going by experience and by the discernment of the flesh and not the spirit. Verse 11, And to him they had regard... Because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. And that's exactly what's going on in a lot of these uh, quote-unquote churches today. Sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, the, ap the apostle Philip, they were baptised, both men and women, as people getting saved. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptised, he continued with Philip, so he is a believer, and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done, the apostolic signs and wonders. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, the Holy Spirit operates in a different fashion in Acts chapter 8 than he does today. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give, also, give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast... hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. 
Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So there's a lot going on here. And this Simon the sorcerer, he is converted. But prior to his, his conversion, he's a deceiver, he's a sorcerer, and he's involved in witchcraft. He wants to tempt the apostles with his money because he wants to impress others with the, with the apostolic gifts. His motive, his heart is not right. He wants to uh, glorify himself and not glorify the Lord. You'll note that all of the Lord's miracles that are performed in the Gospels, they always uh, glorify God. But Simon wants this glory for himself. And what is the impact that he has on other believers? Well, They've all given him heed, haven't they, in verse 10. To whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. He was an attention seeker. As I've just said, if he received this power, if the apostles gave him what he wanted, he'd have drawn people away from the Lord, and he would have looked to receive the glory and the fame. As a type of Christian, devotionally speaking, Simon the Sorcerer is a picture of a carnal babyish Christian who wants to impress others with some spiritual gift. I remember it wasn't long after I got saved uh, that I had the, the charismatics on my case wanting to offer me the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. And it's all about this, uh, well, it, it's a fake gift, and that's a whole different study. But it's all this wanting of something uh, that you don't have. They want to be a higher level of Christian, a more spiritual believer. They want to show off, really, and be at the centre of attention. And you get this in many areas, you know. Some, some Christians get into this charismatic movement and they really believe that they uh, have these signs and wonders. And they're totally deluded. But also, you know, you have Christians who get into this hyper-Israel, hyper-Hebrew movement where they want to impress you with their knowledge of the Hebrew language and so on. And the motive is all wrong. It's all about um, showing off. And also, this, this, this man, Simon the Sorcerer, he's a picture of a Christian who is ignorant of his Lord, thinking that he can buy favour um, with God, with money. He can buy the favour of God with money. And it's totally wrong. You know, we, we get believers who think that by putting extra money in the collection pot or donating some money to a, a, a ministry um, in order to, you know, make up for living a bad week of sin is a good thing. It's not. It's not biblical at all. You know, it's all about the motive the motive behind what you're doing. And we, we see this as well sometimes with these bold street preachers going out, shouting and yelling on the streets. There's nothing wrong with that. You can preach the gospel. But some people get involved with that um, as an attempt, really, to make up for the wrong that's been going on in their lives. We think we can work to earn favour with God. We think we can purchase the favour of God with money. And that the Lord will be impressed with that. Well, he won't be impressed with it. He sees through every uh, false motive. And he knows exactly why you are doing what you are doing. If you're not right with God, you need to return to him. And ask him to forgive you, to cleanse you. And to give you the strength and grace that you need to keep out of sin. And that's not something that... Um, that we can do apart from the Lord. The Lord has to help us. And the outcome of this account of Simon the Sorcerer, what happens to this man? Well, he is strongly rebuked by Peter, the apostle, and he is not allowed to partake in this spiritual gift. And truly, he is a picture of an attention-seeking Christian being rightly denied the limelight in a local church because his motive and his heart was not right with the Lord. They wanted to glorify themselves, to have the attention and praise, 
and they did not want to glorify the Lord. So we've got to be careful of this in ourselves, you know, in, in our motives, why we want to do things, who are we trying to impress, and do we always need to be recognised? That's another thing. I think oftentimes you'll find in life, um, you may do something for another believer or help somebody, but oftentimes it's better that you don't blow your own trumpet, that you just do something for the Lord, you don't seek any glory, and you allow the Lord to to work. Get out of the way of, of the Lord, let him work freely through you. And the last two characters I want to talk about, these troublemakers as it were, are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Hymenaeus and Philetus. And these men appear in 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 14 onwards. The Bible says this, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We are dispensational. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Again, you know, think of all these peripheral issues Christians get bogged down with, they argue, they squabble. There's a lot of things that we don't need to get involved with. We don't always have to offer an opinion. We can learn to keep our mouths shut at times. Uh, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, verse 17, verse 18 now, who concerning the truth have erred, they've departed from the truth, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of son. They're preaching heresy and they're messing up other believers. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Indeed he does. And let every one nameth, sorry, let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. <laughs> Live as sinlessly as you can. <laughs> it's a, it's a tall order, isn't it? But that's what we've to do. We've, tr we've to strive to get away from sin in all areas of our lives. And that's the daily battle. That's your biggest fight. And we also read of Hymenaeus here. He appears in 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20. This charge I uh, commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So, we have blasphemy here. Carnal believers who cannot control their mouths. So, Hymenaeus and Philetus, and Hymenaeus and Alexander, they're involved in some sins here that we ought to uh, examine. So, Hymenaeus and Philetus are involved in heresy. They are teaching that the resurrection is past already. In other words, they are post-trib. There's no rapture coming. We're going to go on into the, the time of Jacob's trouble. And they are overthrowing the faith of some. We'll read of that in a moment. There is no rapture, there is no bodily resurrection. That is what they are both teaching. And that's a, prominent, a prevalent doctrine today, especially on the internet. There's a lot of people that hold to that position, and, and it is incorrect. What else are they doing? Well, Hymenaeus in 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20 he's involved in blasphemy. As I've said, he cannot control his mouth. Alexander's in the same position. And these, these troublemakers, they impact the body of Christ. They overthrow the faith of son. You know, they've led other Christians astray because of their false teachings. And we read at the bottom of, well, 1 Timothy 1, 20 of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, who am I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. They found themselves spiritually shipwrecked because they are not walking in the Spirit. And there's types of Christians that you may meet today. These men, they are a picture of an arrogant, biblically illiterate Christian 
who does not rightly divide his Bible, who does not study, and for whom the Bible is not his final authority. We dealt with many post-trib believers, and oftentimes they've been influenced not by the scriptures themselves, but by the teachings and the cleverly edited videos online of other people and other authors. They are not original in their conclusions. They're a picture of a post-trib Christian who is espousing his false doctrine, who is not thinking about the blessed hope of the resurrection or the rapture, and he is pushing his false beliefs, his false doctrines on others and corrupting them. Is a picture of a carnal believer who is seeking to draw away disciples after himself. He's a deceiver. And Hymenaeus is a picture as well of a carnal Christian who has no control of his tongue and is polluting the ears of those around him by his blasphemy. You don't want to swear, you don't want to blaspheme, you want to keep your mouth and keep your tongue under control through the power of the Holy Spirit. And what is the outcome of their mistakes? Well, they err from the truth. Hymenaeus, he ends up being spiritually shipwrecked. He's a Christian who is out of fellowship with the Lord, and he's been delivered to Satan. Because of his sin, the devil is going to mess up his life after the per permissive will of God. So God's going to allow this to happen in order to teach him a lesson. And that can happen to us. We get out of fellowship with the Lord, we don't pray, we sin, we get worse and worse in our own ways. We're either improving or we're getting worse. There's no um, static phase in the Christian life. You're moving forward or backward every day and you've got to choose which way you're moving. And there's nothing worse than a Christian who is out of fellowship with the Lord. Because you're in a world that you don't belong to, so you feel like an alien, you're out of place here. But you're not in fellowship with God, you're in an incredibly uncomfortable position. So your best bet is to go and get right with the Lord. Ask him to forgive you, ask him to help you start again. Repent, cry out to him and be restored into his fellowship. And as I've said in previous studies, don't give the devil any excuses that he needs to enter your life and mess you up. Because God may use him to scare you, to teach you a lesson in order to get you to change course, to be humbled. So, may we learn from the errors of these men in the Bible, these troublemakers in the New Testament, and may we examine our own selves and those that we come into fellowship with. May we correct one another lovingly and ensure that we are not harming those around us by our sins. And let us make sure that we are not grieving the Lord with our ways. Amen.